It's Thursday, July 28th, and this is now on HNN. I hope it makes it better. From my experience, I've never had a good flight with Spirit. JetBlue Airlines could soon be much larger. I'm Astro Martinez with details of a major merger announcement. Southwest is putting billions behind a new effort to improve customer service. She tried on a uniform that was at a friend's house. An attorney for an alleged Russian spy arrested on Oahu claims she posed in a KGB uniform for fun. These stories plus a preview of the new films headed to theaters. There's a gun. <laughs> Details coming up on This Is Now. At noon, this video just into our newsroom shows Bryant Tejeda Castillo, the Hawaii Marine accused of stabbing his estranged wife to death on the H3 freeway last week, being processed at the Sheriff Division booking station on Keave Street. Witnesses told police they saw Castillo cut himself in the neck area with a knife, and you can see those injuries in this footage. The 29-year-old was indicted and charged with murder yesterday. Also at the booking station today, 46-year-old Jason Walker, who's accused of trying to kill a man with a sword outside a Waikiki 7-Eleven store, and 19-year-old Tyler Legatasia, who allegedly fired a gun at a group of teens at Alawai Community Park, striking one person. Good afternoon. Thank you for watching. This is now. We've got a lot more news to get to. Starting with this, the United States now has more cases of monkeypox than any other country in the world. 11 of those cases right here in Hawaii. Now, the CDC says it expects the number of cases to continue to climb over the next few weeks, and it comes as the Biden administration weighs whether to declare the virus a public health emergency. Michael George has more. This LGBTQ plus community center in White Plains, New York, is hosting a monkeypox vaccine clinic as cases across the country continue to rise. The demand for, the, for vaccination is very high, which is great because that means people want to protect themselves. The CDC says there are now more than 4,600 confirmed cases in the United States, with more than a quarter of the cases in New York and 17% in California. Bottom line is we need to stay ahead of this and be able to end this outbreak. The Health and Human Services Secretary announced Thursday the department will distribute 786,000 newly available doses of the vaccine. Getting the vaccine out is absolutely critical right now. If we want to stop this, if we want to arrest it immediately, we need to get as many folks vaccinated as possible. Federal health officials say they'll prioritize getting the vaccine to areas with the greatest number of people at risk. Monkeypox spreads through skin on skin and other close contact. Anyone can get it. But so far, this outbreak is primarily impacting men who have sex with men. This is very triggering for our community. We are a community that was ravaged in the early 80s by the AIDS epidemic. The Biden administration is still weighing whether to declare monkeypox a public health emergency, which would open up more resources to fight it. Michael George, CBS News, White Plains, New York. Japan is seeing a spike in COVID cases. It had a record high of about 210,000 new cases reported yesterday. The Osaka prefecture is asking the elderly to stay at home if possible to avoid catching the virus, but no major restrictions have been put in place. A judge has ordered Walter Primrose, the Oahu man accused of being a Russian spy by the State Department, to be held without bond. Authorities told the court that they found maps of military facilities and coded messages in the raided Kapolei home. Meanwhile, Primrose's wife says she's not a spy. Arlen Kawano spoke to her attorney. The woman denied being a Russian spy, but admitted it was a KGB jacket she put on for a picture. These photographs are part of the government's evidence accusing Walter Primrose and his wife, Gwen Morrison, of being spies for Russia. Morrison's attorney, Megan Cow, says decades ago, the couple posed for pictures in a KGB jacket. She tried on a uniform that was at a friend's house one time, and they took pictures. Uh, and you can tell from the picture that it's the same uniform. Her and her husband are wearing the same uniform, 
and the pictures taken taken in a home in their friend's home. The couple were arrested last week by the State Department's Diplomatic Security Service, which sees a lot of items from the Kapolei home they shared for years. The two are charged with lying to get passports, identity theft, and conspiracy to harm the U.S. Both allegedly stole the identities of dead children in the 80s while they lived in Texas. The government is trying to have them held without bond. Even if the allegations in the complaint are true, that they stole this, these identities 30 years ago, even under these new identities, they committed no crime. And so to hold them without bail or bond is just unreasonable. Primrose retired from the Coast Guard after 22 years and worked for the Department of Defense as a contractor with a security clearance. I can only imagine that internal investigators at the Coast Guard are really scrubbing every single record that the defendant ever accessed to do an internal threat assessment. They need to understand what, if anything, might be in the hands of our adversaries. I'm Lynn Kawano, Hawaii News Now. President Biden had a much anticipated phone call with Chinese President Xi Jinping today. The phone call, which lasted more than two hours, is part of the Biden administration strategy to maintain and deepen lines of communication. According to a statement released by the White House, the two leaders discussed a range of issues important to the bilateral relationship and other regional and global issues and tasked their teams to continue following up on today's conversation, in particular to address climate change and health security. The statement also said Mr. Biden reiterated the U.S. policy on Taiwan and that it strongly opposes efforts to undermine peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. Unraveling your traveling time, Southwest Airlines calls it a $2 billion attempt to improve customer service. The airline has announced that as of today, any vouchers created by Southwest will be valid until whenever the customer wants to use them. Any vouchers created before this date but which have yet to expire will also have their expiration date removed. Other initiatives in this Southwest passenger experience revamp include enhanced Wi-Fi, new in-seat power, and larger overhead bins. Big merger news in the world of travel. JetBlue Airways has agreed to buy Spirit. Here's Astrid Martinez with more on the deal. JetBlue is bringing a new airline on board. The carrier is buying Spirit Air for $3.8 billion, which would create the nation's fifth largest airline. The deal comes just one day after a potential merger between Spirit and Frontier Airlines fell apart. We've known for weeks that Spirit shareholders were favoring JetBlue's offer over a competing one from Frontier. David Slotnick from The Points Guy says if the deal holds, Spirit will fall under the JetBlue brand. By acquiring Spirit, they can basically double in size overnight. They're going to take on all of Spirit's airplanes, all of their staff, convert everything to the JetBlue style. Under JetBlue, Spirit's rock bottom prices could go away. The airline is known for low rates and often leads the market when it comes to customer complaints. I hope it makes it better. From my experience, I've never had a good flight with Spirit. So hopefully they make a lot of good changes to that. But this deal is likely to face scrutiny and it must clear many hurdles before becoming a reality. The Department of Justice is going to have to approve this merger. And uh, this DOJ has stated that it is concerned about approving mergers in highly concentrated industries. The argument here and the one that JetBlue needs to make to regulators is that by combining with Spirit, they'll be able to compete with the other big four. So that's American, Delta, United, Southwest. That process will take time. Even if regulators and shareholders approve the merger, their airlines don't expect to operate as a single carrier until 2025. Astrid Martinez, CBS News, LaGuardia Airport, New York. It's the stuff of science fiction. Delta is looking to eliminate current airport screens cluttered with information from dozens of flights. The company is testing technology at Detroit's airport that allows up to 100 travelers to privately see their personal flight information on the same screen, creating what it calls a parallel reality effect. Essentially what they've done is they've developed pixel technology where each pixel on their screen can show multiple projections to different 
places in an area. Now here's Howard Dykus with an in-depth look at the June hotel report. Now let's break it all down by county, starting from uh, left to right across your uh, television screen. Uh, Kauai was 83% full, which uh, compared to 74% for full uh, back uh, before pre-COVID. Uh, the uh, average room rate on Kauai was more than, 400, uh, more than $400 a night, and that was up by almost half from before COVID. Oahu was a lot less full, but 77% is not bad. That's actually down from uh, almost 88% full pre-COVID. The uh, average room rate uh, didn't change as, as much. It was up 17% to $284 a night. Maui was only 70% full. Maui resort hotels were basically accepting lower occupancy in order to charge a lot more, an average $644 a night, which is up two-thirds from pre-COVID. Big Isle, similar, uh, up 65% 60, uh, in terms of what it was charging, $411 a night on average. And uh, that left a, a room rate, a, 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 an occupancy rate of more than 70%. Now, the, you're, you're seeing differences in terms of overall room rate and overall uh, occupancy, but uh, if you look at the luxury rates, you'll see that there's a lot more going on right now in terms of revenue. And this is room revenue only, so it doesn't count what, what is being charged for things like uh, restaurants that are located on campus or uh, uh, spa treatments and stuff like that. So the hotels are basically doing a lot better than before. Four of the six leading candidates for governor accepted our invitation to sit down for the job interview. It was a chance for them to outline their priorities and set the record straight on a number of issues. HNN's acting news director, Daryl Huff, joins Dylan Anchetta to provide insight on the process of putting it all together. Daryl, thank you so much for joining us today. Tell our audience more about the format of the job interview. Well, thanks, Dylan. The original idea actually came from the New York Times during the presidential election of uh, 2016, when they actually invited all of the Democratic candidates into their editorial board. The New York Times has this humongous editorial board with experts in all kinds of different areas. And they were the first ones to really say, let's make this completely manager of Hawaii News Now was running for mayor. Mm -hmm. And we were concerned that someone would accuse us of not being tough enough on him or being too tough on his opponents. And so rather than have a traditional mayor's debate, we decided to go ahead and the interview, which is uh, what the New York Times did. We call it the job interview. So that's where that mm -hmm. came about. And it's what makes this different from your traditional debate? Well, I, I would also could ever imagine it's it's you're <laughs> uh -huh. a politician and you're sitting across from six seasoned journalists who are mm -hmm. going to ask you the toughest questions they also know your history they know where you're weak on an issue and they will pick you apart mm -hmm. piece by piece and so we had the two uh civil beat journalists uh chad blair and blaze level along with myself grace lee and Bahailani richardson from hawaii news now mm -hmm. and so we basically just came up with a list of topics we invite them in, we don't tell them anything in advance, and we just fire away. And it seems like almost nothing was off limits there. I mean, from the personal issues that have made the headlines to records and all of that things. And I also think it's interesting to see how they do individually. Uh, in the traditional debate, obviously, they're with their opponents on stage, but one candidate doesn't know the answers in the job interview from another candidate. Which I, I think that what's important to understand is that there, in each of these political formats, there's a different reason that you do it as a journalist, mm -hmm. right? And so, generally speaking, the traditional debate is very formal, very 30 seconds and then a minute and then 30 seconds rebuttal. And we find that to be very boring and not very helpful to viewers because, <laughs> uh -huh. you know, the candidates all know how to play the game. They know that in this particular format, I could get a zinger into my opponent without them being able to respond. So mm -hmm. we tend to, in the debates, try and find ways to force them out of their comfort zone and into a place where they're going to have to be quick on their feet and handle their opponents and handle the audience and so on. That's mm -hmm. a very intentional thing that we do at Hawaii News Now in a debate. Now, that's different from traditional debate. The job interview, though, really does provide a full hour of talk between the candidate and, and usually the candidate knows us. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we're familiar to them, they're familiar to us. And so 
it actually falls into sort of an interesting rhythm. Sometimes you'll see people joking back and forth. Yeah. Sometimes they'll refer to some individual story they have a grievance about, mm -hmm, <laughs> start mm -hmm. getting a fight, and then poor yeah. Mahilani goes, okay, calm down, you know, just <laughs> let's yes. move on. And so it's, it's really a great format. And I think everybody actually does pretty well. Most mm -hmm. of them do better in the job interview than they do in a traditional debate. Watch the job interview tonight at 8 p.m. on K5. You can also watch all of our in-depth conversations with candidates in our special section at your HNN digital platforms. Parts of Kentucky and Virginia are underwater after heavy rains pounded the area, unleashing deadly floodwaters. Dan Sheneman has the latest. Swift, destructive floodwaters surged through eastern Kentucky. We are currently experiencing one of the worst, most devastating flooding events in Kentucky's history. The governor has declared a state of emergency for the entire state. Authorities report multiple water rescues, at least three confirmed deaths, more are missing. Unfortunately, uh, I expect double digit deaths uh, in this flooding. That's something that we rarely see. Entire neighborhoods engulfed by water and thousands of homes left without power. Some roads are impassable. At least one family managed to escape to safety just before water reached their home. And then we got out, we pulled out here to the road and about 10 minutes later we looked out and it went from the back of the fence to the carport. Intense flooding also ravaging western Virginia. The small town of Pound cut off. The only way in or out is by boat. Hopefully we can get a break in the rain and get everybody back where they need to be at and be safe. But the threat is not over. More rain is expected tonight. Dan Sheneman, NBC News. Look for updates on that story on later editions of H&N and on your NBC Nightly News. Want to switch gears now to our weather. We have some changes out there. Those winds are turning down. Mother mm -hmm. Nature's natural AC is going to be off for a couple days. Here's Guy Hoggy with an update. We're not going to see a whole lot of rain anytime soon. However, Kauai could see some heavy downpours today and tomorrow with the light wind weather pattern. And with the light wind weather pattern, you can see there's not a whole lot, although tomorrow in the afternoon time looks like there's going to be some moisture for the Big Island. Otherwise, we're not going to see any significant rainfall until sometime on Monday. Trade winds come back and we'll see a nice uh, band of windward and mocha showers come through, but very brief and very light. So not a whole lot of rain over the next seven days. So the weather pattern is going to change right with the light winds humidity levels will be climbing morning sunshine afternoon clouds afternoon showers clearing in the overnight hours so really nice weather although it's going to be a little sticky with higher humidity levels today and tomorrow and then on saturday the trade winds come back in clear out whatever particulates in the air clean out the fog and we'll have nice conditions out there although we could see a few more showers again for those windward areas on monday did you know butterflies are at risk? Our Casey Lund shows us what's being done to save the beautiful bugs in Hawaii. Well, you wouldn't call it a sanctuary, but Foster Botanical Garden is home to a very popular spot for the monarch butterfly. This patch of milkweed, just as you enter the park, is a place you can see plenty of them, uh, depending on what time of day you come. And even if you don't see the butterflies in their adult form out flying around, it's easy to spot them here in their caterpillar form. This morning, we were able to talk to a butterfly expert of sorts about what the population's doing here in Hawaii. Uh, the monarch butterfly came here in the 1850s, so they're not native here. And they are a, they don't play a huge role in pollination, but they are a pollinator. And pollinators are extremely important. A, th a third of our food resources come from um, pollinated plants. Daniel Babbitt works for the Department of Parks and Rec at the city. Once, though, he worked in the Butterfly Pavilion at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Babbitt says the only native species to Hawaii are the Kamehameha butterfly and the Blackburn's blue, or more commonly known as the Hawaiian blue or koa butterfly. Hawaii also supports 955 native species of moths. While the decline in monarchs is a much bigger problem in their natural migratory patterns of North America, it tells the story of a much larger problem. So we have the same issues. So we do have habitat loss and we do have climate change affecting our the species here. I mean, even especially our native species like the Kamehameha butterfly and the koa butterfly. And so having invasives coming in, 
invasive birds eating them, but also they're getting driven up to higher elevations. And so it's harder for them to find food and you know, the habitat they need to survive. Yes, while the monarch butterfly isn't extremely important to our local ecosystem, it certainly wouldn't be a good thing if we lost them. There's a lot we can all do to help fight habitat decline for all sorts of animals. And of course, bigger picture, we can all take steps to reduce our impact on the climate. You can learn more about Hawaii's butterflies, including our native species, the Kamehameha and the Hawaii Blue or Koa butterfly, online at hawaiinewsnow.com. Reporting at Foster Botanical Gardens, I'm Casey Lund. For now, we'll send things back to you. Love Foster Botanical Gardens. Oh, yeah. I Great rarely spot. see butterflies anymore. Yeah, I don't see them too often. You will see them there. As Casey pointed out, they have that special plant that sort of attracts mm -hmm. them. So, very cool. Let's see what else the internet is a buzz about today. And if you're a fan of Sprite, there's going to be some changes. Yeah, get ready to say goodbye to those green bottles starting next week. After more than 60 years, Sprite is ditching its familiar green bottles in favor of clear ones that are easier to recycle. Mm. The current bottles contain material that can only typically be recycled for use in single-use items. The new bottles can be recycled and used in the production of new bottles over and over again. I see. The change is over uh, is expected to be completed by the end of 2022. Got it. Yeah. Well, NASA is planning on bringing rock samples from Mars back to Earth. Now, the mission will now include the use of two helicopters to retrieve samples, but it will take years for the spacecraft to make it to Mars and back. The Earth Return Orbiter launches in the fall of 2027, so a couple years away, and the Sample Retrieval Lander launches in the summer of 2028. The samples are expected to arrive back on Earth in 2033. So cool. Very cool space news. All right, let's talk about entertainment, and there's still some summer blockbuster movies to be released. Let's turn things over to Rick Damagella with an update. There's a gun on Shrew. It's the quiet car. Gotta use your small inside voice in here, son. There's a gun. <clears throat> Brad Pitt rides the bullet train. The action comedy features Pitt going up against a group of fellow underworld types, chasing a mysterious briefcase on a high-speed train bound from Tokyo. The train leaves the station August 5th. Who wants to play bodies, bodies, bodies? <laughs> So how do you play? An innocent game turns deadly in Bodies, Bodies, Bodies after a group of young people caught in a hurricane during a house party stumble into a real murder. The thriller hits theaters August 12th. These three minutes of life were taken out of the flow of time. Helena Bonham Carter narrates three minutes a lengthening. The documentary looks at the only film footage of a small Jewish community in 1938 Poland prior to the Holocaust. The film opens in theaters August 19th. Leave right now. The guy in the gray hoodie is robbing the bank. Who's in charge here? John Boyega stars in Breaking, based on the true story of Marine veteran Brian Brown Easley and his actions following a denial of Veterans Affairs support. The drama arrives in theaters August 26th. In Hollywood, I'm Rick Damagella. Exciting stuff there. I yeah. will not be seeing bodies, bodies, bodies. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting name, too. All right, that's it for This Is Now. Ashley is back with you at first at 4 on KHNL. Have a great afternoon. See ya.